suit ready up. you're welcome to come along if you want you just want film anything or just no just lace up and come along all right then pull. lace up with your solids and let's go i can do that what's up guys welcome back to another video today we're talking about the five things we wish we knew sooner in deer hunting this was ted's idea by the way this is my brainchild here <laughs> we uh we're assigned to come up with some unique videos to shoot this summer so this is the first one we're going with we're going to discuss a few different things the first one's going to be buck bedding and then we'll have four more tips after that and if you follow along throughout the video you'll learn what those are wait till you see what the last one is <laughs> oh, you got a good one queued up, oh. up your sleeve. Oh yeah. So let's go down and uh, cover buck bedding to start. Yeah, these are not permethrin approved pants right now. Oh, they're not? They're not permethrin treated. Yeah. These are just Carhartt tan pants that I've that. been wearing all day. That's a little Lone Star right there, I think. Yep. Get him off me before he gives me some sort of disease. Look at all this ideal habitat in here, Greg. You guys opened up the canopy and look what came. All kinds of early succession. Opened up the canopy and then Jake's been in here with his sprayer spraying this rose. We've had deer and turkeys right up in here. Actually saw a nice buck yesterday <laughs> right up there. Or almost killed a long beard that was right here. Yeah, we each own just over an acre here in Iowa. My <laughs> <laughs> dream property. Living the dream. Can you see me in here, Greg? How about now? <laughs> it's about where a big buck's head would be if he was to stand up and scan around here. I'm standing in a deer bed right now and understanding how and where deer bed was a huge sort of revelation for us. We made a heck of a lot of mistakes before we understood that. We just basically equated bedding to be in a thick area somewhere and we just figured deer would be in the middle of it. That is not the case. And the more we learned about it, the more success we started to have. I used to think deer bedded in just thick areas. If I just saw a thick area on the landscape, I was like, well, that's just a bedding area and I would just kind of generalize it all. And if you all have followed us along over the last few years, we've tried to understand how and why deer bed in the areas that they do. I'm standing over a deer bed right here in the edge of this little thicket next to this water. And all this is is a patch of willows right here that's only 10 yards wide by 15 yards long. And there's two big beds that me and Greg are standing here in right on the end of these willows next to this water. And if you kind of lift the camera up, you can see what the deer can see out here from the bed. They're looking through all this thick cover across that water and up onto that far hillside. So they're not actually bedded right in the middle of the thick stuff. They're right in the edge of it where they can see danger coming from a distance most of the time with the wind blowing over from the back. And once we start applying those basic principles of how deer bed, we started having more success as far as encounters and killing big bucks. We've learned that not all bedding areas are equal, but this one in particular that we're standing in, we just blew a doe out of here on the way in here actually. This one looks a lot like the one that me and Gooch killed the big buck out of a few years ago. It's just at the bottom of a hole right here, a few willows, it's not overly thick. Thick. Deer can lay in here and they can see a long distance. They can sit here with wind advantage at their back and they got permanent water and lots of different food sources within 40, 50 yards of this bedding area. On that particular hunt, the buck was bedded down in a hole out of the wind. He was actually in the bedding area well before daylight and we were set up just on one of these adjacent ridges looking down in here trying to spot him as he stands up and browses around mid-morning and eventually we did and had to make a little maneuver on him to get a shot but he was using something very similar to this one where this doe was laid up at on top of that it's a spot where people rarely go so it has a lot of things going for it and once you understand all of those factors and why deer are using the bedding areas that they're using you'll start to be able to predict it across the landscape and it'll help you have more success down in here where she's at i can see them boys walking across the edge of that water over there hey can you guys see me ah, nope. see right there that's the definition of a bedding area i can see them they can't see me in here and if i gotta escape if i'm the buck and i see them coming I can jump up and I can run right back up through this thick stuff and up into the woods. Not Those a carrot. would never know that you were here. No, they wouldn't, <laughs> unless they see my white tail flickering as I ran over that hill. All right, so the second thing that I wish I knew sooner is how to have more of a mobile tree stand set up. Right now, Jake and I have got two different examples out here. We got what we used to use, which is the, this heavy tree stand with the heavy sticks pretty loud which we're laughing about it now but at the time that even that was like pretty game changing for us compared to just having like a lock on tree stand and permanent setups and stuff like that like you could carry this out to the woods it was heavy i mean we, greg and i were talking about it i think these sticks themselves weigh 10 pounds and the stand weighs 10 plus pounds and ted's 
whole setup probably doesn't weigh more than 10 pounds now. Yeah. So with all of our camera gear, we're carrying 30 plus pounds of just pure metal basically clanging up against each other. And now as you, Ted can turn around, he's got less than 10 pounds on his back right there. So we've cut it in half. You can see he's got everything stealth stripped, everything's quiet. So we just talked about back biting down there, I'm getting close. Having a bunch of metal clanging up against each other is not ideal when you're trying to set up real close to a buck. So I think that's just another little thing that we picked up is just trying to have everything stealth stripped and yeah. as quiet as possible, which that stuff is. Yeah, and a lot of times since we've been hunting the bedding areas, we found ourselves having to go a lot deeper onto some public ground to actually get to those spots and hunt those spots. So carrying this on your back is a lot easier than <laughs> carrying that. Yep. So now you guys can see the difference between our old setups and our new setups. And these things have completely changed the way that we hunt. And here's a few ways they have done that. So with these setups, obviously we've been talking about how much lighter they are to carry and how much more comfortable they are. I got this fanny pack. I got this predator pack with these nice shoulder straps compared to what we used to use, which was, you know, basically some string. Some spaghetti. And then Warb had some pipe insulation taped on there, which really, <laughs> you can see how that turned out. <laughs> it didn't do much for you. Your shoulders were gonna be sore either way. But with this thing, it makes it a lot easier. So yeah, and like Ted said, once we get way back into these spots, it is a lot easier to set up. Sometimes within 80 yards of deer we've set up. We go in there anticipating a buck to be in a specific bed and get all set up and sure enough, they stand up right in front of us. Where with this thing, it just made it much more challenging. And he also mentioned the ease of setting this stuff up. A lot of times during the rut, we'll set up for an hour or so, two hours, nothing's happening. We'll just pick up, move shot because you know there's some action going on somewhere. So there's no point in just sitting there waiting for the action to come to you. And I'm, I'm sure you've seen videos of us wearing the saddles on the ground even. We all use the tethered saddles, as you guys know. So these mobile setups are definitely something you're gonna wanna check out and they have changed the way that we hunt. I got enough back problems. Maybe this would straighten it up. Let's fix my posture. <laughs> these nice, uh, maybe a buck bed back in there um all right your turn <laughs> sometimes within 80 yards of deer we've set up knowing that they're or <laughs> that's good and he also mentioned just the ease of setting them up just being ready <laughs> we all use the tethered saddle system as you guys know that <laughs> and uh now i lost my train of thought oh this is brutal All right, another thing I wish I would have learned sooner is to aim lower when shooting at deer. Going back about 30 years when I started bow hunting, the general rule of thumb was to aim behind the shoulder and about halfway up. Now we put the arrow through the lungs, which don't get me wrong, that's a lethal shot. And that feels like that's the safest place to aim. Center mass gives you the most margin of error. However, unlike this 3D target, most deer react to the sound of the shot. They instinctively drop their body to load up their back legs to quickly get out of the area. And by doing so, the deer changes where its vitals are at. Especially if you were aiming center mass on the deer, it can result in a miss or even worse, a high non-lethal wounding shot. Now inside of about 17, 18 yards, Typically the deer can't drop far enough to make much of a difference, but beyond you know, 20 yards to 25 yards and beyond, they can drop anywhere from six to eight to 10 inches or more. So then this begs the question, where's the best spot to aim? You know, Going back to my early years of bow hunting, it was behind the shoulder and halfway up. However, with more experience of shooting deer over the years, I found that the spot that I wanna hit, rather, instead of shooting behind the shoulder, is straight up the leg, one third of the way up. And hitting a deer here will not only go through both lungs, but it'll hit the top of the heart and also possibly sever a major vessel coming off of the heart. And this will make for an extremely quick and humane kill and also typically gives you a really good blood trail. So nowadays, instead of aiming for center mass like I did back when I started, I'm essentially aiming for the top of the heart again straight up the leg, about a third way up. If the deer is under, like I said, 17, 18 yards, I'm pretty much gonna aim dead on. Now, the general rule of thumb now, if a deer is beyond 20 yards, I'm aiming for the heart, the low heart. That way, if the deer doesn't drop, still gonna hit it in the heart. And if it does react, that gives me the largest margin of error for the deer to duck into that shot and still end up with that arrow going through the deer's vitals. Here's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. This buck that I shot in South Dakota last year, he was 23 yards. I had rattled, so he came in looking for the source of that sound. He was on alert. So by reading the situation, I knew that buck was gonna drop at the sound of the shot. He was 23 yards, so I held my 20 yard pin just above his body line. When I shot, he ducked right into it and it hit that exact spot I'm talking about 
straight up the leg, just under halfway up, cut through the top of his heart, he ran 70 yards and piled up. If we play the shot back, you look at it in slow motion, you can tell if I would have aimed center mass on that deer, where I used to when I started out bow hunting, that arrow would have hit him maybe barely in the top of the back. We've been through the school of hard knocks, had some heartbreak along the way, and we've learned to aim lower, farther forward, and have had much better results aiming in that spot. All right, so the next tip in this video, as you can see, is milkweed. This is something that we use all the time. You guys have seen us using it pretty much every deer hunting video. And this is a tip that I wish I'd have known sooner because previous to finding out about milkweed, we'd use either whatever the wind forecast was on the weather channel and just hunt in locations based off that, and we'd use the puffer bottle. And obviously those two things can have several flaws. One with the weather channel, it's not very specific. They'll just give you a direction and a lot of times they're wrong. So you go out to a spot that, and hunting it for a west wind and you might get out there and it's an east wind or a northeast wind or something. So we'll still use that for a reference, but then once we get out there, that's when we pull our milkweed out and then hunt based off what this is telling us. The other thing we used to use is a puffer bottle and I'm sure many of you have had experiences with those. It's just got white powder in there and you flip it up and it'll just kind of drift off, but then it'll disappear within a couple feet and you don't really get a good gauge on what that's doing other than the predominant wind in that spot. So what we've gone to now is milkweed and you flip this stuff out, take a little bit out there and you just flip it up in the air and you can see a little bit better as to what the wind's doing and right now it's going straight up. It's actually going straight behind Jake, which is Nothing's gonna smell you up there. No, nothing's gonna smell you. And that's gonna give you a lot better idea of where deer is gonna be able to smell you. A lot of times if you're hunting in hilly terrain, the wind's gonna be doing some weird stuff, might be swirling and all that jazz. And with milkweed, you can see that. You can see it as it's going down a ridge or going through a little valley or something and see exactly where the wind is going. So that way you have a better idea of where deer are gonna be able to smell you. Another big advantage to that is if you can see exactly where that wind is going or wherever the thermals are taking your scent, you'll be able to know right where a deer is gonna be able to smell you. And if one comes in that you wanna shoot, you'll know where you gotta stop him and shoot him before he gets to that wind. So milkweed is a really great tool for all that. And I think it helps you to actually understand how thermals work when you get out there. It took me a long time to actually figure out how thermals worked. When the sun warms up the ground, the thermals are gonna be rising, and when the ground cools down, thermals are gonna be dropping down the hill. It'll help speed up that learning process, and then you, in turn, you'll be able to predict that a little bit better and know before you go into a spot what the wind's gonna be doing and what the thermals are gonna be doing, so. And sometimes use it to your advantage to get closer to deer than what you might think. Yeah, exactly, because like you just saw when I threw that piece of milkweed up, it went straight up and behind Jake and the camera. Puffer bottle is not gonna really show you that. It's probably just gonna sit and fall straight down. Where when you have milkweed, if you can see all those little movements that your scent is doing, it'll help you know exactly what's going on out there and help you get a lot closer to deer in the future. I spooked a buck. Now what? My hunt's over. Ah. Hang on. Just relax a minute. Sit down. Take a chill pill. It's not that big a deal. Used to think it was. Back in the day when I'd spook a buck, I'd march back to the truck, stomp and pissed off and head to the house. But after we've had several experiences spooking them in the last few years, my mind has began to change a little bit, especially after we've had success bumping and dumping bucks, sometimes even in the same day. Off the top of my head, I can think of numerous examples. Ted and Jake bumped a buck a couple years ago in the middle of a rut with a boat. He spooked with a doe. They went around, got on him almost immediately, and called him straight in. Buck basically acted like that he never even saw him. Me, Greg, and Gooch ran into that big buck in Georgia with a muzzleloader. We spooked the heck out of him and his doe, followed him for like three or 400 yards, and I think it was like a couple hours later, we ended up getting a shot at him. And that same year, earlier that fall, me and Gooch bumped a buck in some big woods, watched where he went, he spooked and ran like four or 500 yards, and then we got back to the house, we relaxed a little bit, we thought about other potential bedding areas that he might be using within that general vicinity, and we went in there the next morning and killed him about 300 yards from where we spooked him. Point is, you're not out of the game if you spook a big buck. In fact, that may be the best thing that happens to you all season because now you know where he's at. If he smells you, that could be a little bit different story, but most often we spook him when we're walking around and when we're headed into the wind 
it's hard for them to smell us. We bump into a buck along the edge of a bedding area where we didn't expect him to be. He sees us or hears us and takes off running through the brush. Sometimes they'll come right back to that same spot. Often they'll end up just escaping to the next available cover and then calming back down within the next hour or two. Just think about where he's going and how you can intercept him that day in the next best available bedding area, the one that he's headed towards, or back out of there and then come back in there in the next few days and hunt those other bedding areas within that area. He's probably not going real far, at least that's been our experience. Moral of the story though is if you spook a big buck, just relax, you're still in the game. And that's our five things we wish we knew sooner as deer hunters. Hopefully they helped you guys out. Thanks for watching. Nick, the food ready? Not yet. Ready to start. Dinner time. <laughs>